Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and our friend Brian Broom, and today we are talking about epistemology, which is one of my favorite subjects, and specifically we're talking about neutrality in epistemology, and I wanted to open with one of my favorite lines of poetry from Bob Dylan, where he says, you either got faith or you got unbelief, but there ain't no neutral ground. He really said that. He did. Yes. He was a wise man at times. Yeah. He also said you got to serve somebody. It yeah. may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but, but you, you got to serve somebody. somebody. And these two things go hand in hand. What we're talking about is, is it possible to know without morality and therefore religious commitment getting in the way. Can't we just leave our religious presuppositions on the shelf and go out and talk like reasonable men and women using the laws of Aristotle's logic and the mathematics of Newton and uh, Leibniz and come up with a neutral consensus unaffected by religion, morality, which then can inform our religion and morality all it likes. Hmm. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to use Genesis chapter 3 as a launching board. And so I will read. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Along comes the serpent and asks a seemingly innocent question. Has God really said you can't eat from any of these trees? But notice the bias in the question. Wow, was God really that cheap and chintzy? He has all this. He was not sharing with you. I mean, just asking. I heard rumors. I'm just asking around, and people said say things. You know, just coming to the horse's mouth, just just to find out. And she says, "No, I, we can eat of all of them. Oh, except for the one." And God has said, "This one tree, we're not to eat of it. We're not even to touch it." Mm. God had not said that, lest we die, lest dying we shall die, surely die. And the serpent said, you're not, you will not surely die. The Hebrews were like, dying, you shall die, not. <laughs> but God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, you'll be as gods in this particular sense, knowing, deciding for yourself what's good and evil. This whole thing is fraught with ethical currents and undertoes and overtoes and whatever or other kind of things you want to throw in there. We're talking ethics. God has said, this is what you are to do, or in this case, what you're not to do. And Satan, of all people, comes along and says, nah, don't believe God. So we're dealing in religion, we're dealing in ethics, and we're dealing in epistemology. How do I know and how do I know that I know? Do I trust God because he's God and because I made in his image and because the whole world around me shouts his glory? Or do I trust Satan, this serpent who just started talking to me? That was weird, but you know. He's, people know things. And um, he's my new friend. I, I trust my friends a lot. Or, well, he's saying that I should put this as some kind of test. Maybe, um, you know, rational deduction, empirical observation, mystical, using the false to find out what's going on here. Or existential assertion. Something in there somewhere, something in me, some facet of my being, personality, intellect, soul, can come to this in a neutral fashion and come up with a neutral answer that will be true and that I can trust. And then I'll know whether or not I can trust God or whether I can trust the devil. And Satan's putting this forward, and you used the word neutrality earlier, 
as a neutral enterprise. Uh, I'm not saying reject God. I'm not saying believe me. I'm saying trust yourself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Just figure it out for yourself. Don't listen to the voice of authority, except that authority which speaks in your own heart or mind or will or what will you. But the idea that anything here is neutral is nonsense. God comes and says, I'm the Lord your God. I made you. I breathe life into you. You are my image. Every thought you think I have ordained, the world around you, the air you breathe, it's mine. The earth you walk on is mine. The stars that shine, they, ref they reflect my glory. You know who I am. And as that God, I am telling you, stay away from the tree. Or more literally, don't eat from the tree. You can walk <laughs> all around it all you want to, but don't eat from it. Yeah, in fact, that kind of Eve's addition to the command kind of shows foreshadows the Pharisees building walls yes. around walls around God's commands that we're not even going to go near it. We're not even going to spit on the ground lest we accidentally plow a field and water a seed. <laughs> I heard that one. That's you good. have to be careful because if you spit on the ground, something could flower up and then later someone could have a field there based on that one flower and somebody could plow it on uh, the Sabbath. And you just got to <laughs> avoid all that kind of danger. Yeah. 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 yeah Stay away from is, that. Everything is dangerous. <laughs> Uh, there, there's, there's a great deal of Phariseeism about this chapter. We might as well point it out while we're, while we're here. You're right. Eve adds to the word of God. God had not said, don't touch it. Now, we're not told where that idea came from. Did Adam suggest it as he was instructing his wife? We read back in the previous chapter, God had told Adam about the tree. He hadn't told Eve. And when he issued the dominion mandate, he told him that all the trees were there. That, this means Adam had to... Say, Eve, they're all ours, but one for now is off limits. And this is what God has told me, and I'm now telling you. Did he do a good job as a, as a godly husband instructing his wife in the word of God? Or did he do fine and she made something up on the spur of the moment? Because it, again, sounded like a good idea. And Adam, standing there watching her, did he see this and say, wait, wait, wait remember that? No, that was me. Or no, Eve, what are you doing? That's not what God said. Anyway, both of them, and it's it's easy to point fingers and blame either Adam or Eve. Covenantally, Adam's responsible, but they both had their fling at sin here. <laughs> but the, the, the thing that Satan offers them is the privilege of being as God, knowing good and evil. Well, how does God know good and evil? He defines it out of his own being. So again, Pharisaism, you get to make the rules and judge everybody else. There's nothing here particularly about phenomenal cosmic power. <laughs> the, the issue, again, is, is ethical. You get to make rules. Satanism and Phariseeism are kissing cousins. There's hardly a bit of difference between the two. And uh, we, we look in the Old Testament, we see a great deal of pagan magic, and we get to the New, and we just see Pharisees and the rules, and we think, oh, these are two different worlds. But they're not. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, what is... What is your authority? Who is your authority? How do you know what's true? How do you know what's right and wrong? And, and, and why is that a sufficient basis? Now, if God, as he says, if he's the creator of heaven and earth, if nothing exists aside from his decree and his plan, uh, if, not, if nothing exists that is not upheld by his providence and moved by his power, then everything must testify of God. And any fact to be a fact must be a created fact, a providentially governed fact, a fact that plays into the gospel, and a fact that God knows intimately and to which he gives meaning. On the other hand, if there is no such God, then the whole idea of factness is kind of odd. There, there's stuff, call them brute facts, call them matter, call them particles, call them rocks, whatever. There's stuff out there. At least we think there's stuff out there. I seem to sense stuff out there. I have these eyes and these ears and this nose and this tongue, and they tell me there's stuff out there. Oh, wait. Anybody seen The Matrix? How do I know it's real? And what is reality anyway? I used to ask my kids, in school, have you seen The Matrix? They used to say yes. Now they say what? <laughs> I actually haven't seen it, but everything okay, I've yeah, heard about it has come from philosophy and Bible classes. <laughs> yeah, I saw the really... second one by accident, thinking it was oh. the first. That's oh, a bad I'm sorry. idea. Yeah, that was, yeah, I'm sorry about that. The first one is worth seeing. 
there is one moment of, of blasphemy, but within the context, it makes sense. A passing character looks at the protagonist and says, you're my own Jesus Christ. But that's the whole point. That, he, that hero is the Messiah of that universe because he's the one who comes to understand that all of reality is an illusion and he's able to escape it and get behind the scenes of the Matrix, behind the computer simulations, and become mankind's savior. So for people who are struggling with Plato's Cave or Immanuel Kant's Numenal Phenomenal Realms, it is a good illustration. If you don't want to see it, just read a summary, which we kind of just gave you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the question is, I, I have these senses. Do I trust them? But take it back one more. I have this rationality. Do I trust it? The universe is born of chaos, science tells me. Uh, how, where do the laws of logic come from? And how do, and, and aren't they actually signals conveyed on the neural impulses of my brain, which is itself a massive accident of electron uh, intersection? And what in the world does that have to do with the world out there, assuming there is a world out there? Why is there a connection? One of the problems that modern mathematicians, philosophers of mathematics are facing is, yeah, we can do this wonderful math in our heads and it all works. Why does it connect with the outside world? And mathematicians really don't have an answer for that. Epistemology has, has often been the, uh, the area where a lot of people, both profound philosophers and very simple people, have assumed a simplicity and obviousness where it's not. Now, if God knows everything because he made everything uh, by his power and his wisdom, so it all fulfills his plan, then he knows all about everything. He knows all the numbers in pi or e. He understands how imaginary numbers work. Uh, he knows how long eternity is and all the, all the things that are going to come throughout forever. He knows us down to the nanometer and beyond. He knows everything. And so when he turns to us and says, this is the way it is, we have good grounds for trusting him, both because of his omniscience and because he's a good God who means well to his people, and he wants to tell us the truth. He himself being truth, he delights to share truth, and we were made to delight in receiving truth and to believe him, and that, of course, is what he's facing here. Will she fulfill that role? Will she simply receive the truth? Because it is obviously truth, self-evidently truth, because the alternative is, and that's what we need to talk about a little bit, the alternatives. Mm -hmm. Satan says, stand on the neutral ground of your own autonomous personality, figure this tree out without reference to God. Mm -hmm. So she's already being asked to disbelieve in God. That's called unbelief. That's called hating God. That's called covenant breaking. Satan does not point that out. He's <laughs> pretending there's a neutral ground here. King's X, a uh, home base and tag where you can just, you can stand here and you're not on this side, you're not on that side. So you can, you can do that. And then you, you need to sort things out. And the philosophy, the history of philosophy, is one of picking one or another attribute of, of the human soul and saying, this is it. Some people want to begin deductively with first principles. I think, therefore, I am. I have this idea of perfection in my head. It did not come from me. Therefore, it must come from someone outside me. Being perfect, this thing would not let me be deceived, and therefore, whatever I perceive must be essentially true. And since I perceive this tree to be a good thing, and since I don't hear anything correcting me, yeah, must be safe. I'll go for it. <laughs> or I got these senses. I can feel. I can touch. I can. I can extend them with scientific instruments. I can pull out my my ruler and my slide ruler and my laptop and my chemical analysis and my tricorder, and I can nail this thing down in its chemical analysis. I can give you its DNA. I will know all about this. Yeah, you're trusting rather blindly in the value of your senses. So again, matrix, rainbows, dreams. How do you know that it's really out there? Sam Johnson, the creator of the dictionary, kicked a rock and said, ow, see, it's really there. <laughs> that doesn't get it. Because, of no. course, David Hume would reply, no. The, the pain is just sensations in your head. You do not know what's behind that. If you're a good romantic, you can descend into your heart and, and meditate upon the tree there and find your essential oneness with the tree. 
You can reach out with your feelings and embrace the tree and come to the certain knowledge that nature never did betray the heart that loved her, that there is a force, a power that flows through all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Me and the tree and we are one. Now I know the tree to be perfectly safe. Or I didn't say enough of this thinking. I'm going to go make an action and that action will decide the tree. I'm be an existentialist. <laughs> I, I think I've hit most of the major categories of thought. And the, the problems here, first of all, every one of them starts by rejecting God. It's not simply some neutral place because there is none. Given who God is, there's no neutral ground. You cannot say, well, God hasn't spoken. God doesn't care. I can step over here. And God doesn't see. doesn't matter. No, God claims everything. You're the image of God. You can't get away from that. So anything that claims to be neutral is, if it is actually an offense to God, affront to God. You are rebelling against God. But when you turn to yourself, you're suddenly assuming that your reason is valid or your senses are valid or your emotion and that tree are somehow connected. That's a religious assumption, hardly an argument. Or that you acting is going to define reality. Again, a huge assumption, not an argument. There, without God, who knows everything, we're not left with anything. We don't even know what we know. We don't know if our brains are working. We don't know if they're in tune with the universe. We don't know what's behind the universe. We don't know if this is a dream, computer simulation, a hologram, a dream in the mind of God. And, and the best philosophers in the end have admitted this. You think of David Hume, for instance, or Immanuel Kant, who said, you're right, but that's the solution. And that's another story. <laughs> and all our existentialist authors who keep insisting, no, you don't. There's no absolute truth, but you can impose your will on the universe in this acting moment. How's that work exactly? <laughs> Trust me, it does. Yeah, we're trusting you. So there, there, there's a problem. We're not. This is not particularly a series on epistemology or apologetics. But here at the beginning of all things, we really do need to help everyone who's listening understand that we stand on the Word of God. We believe the Bible because it's God's Word. And because the Holy Spirit within us echoes that affirmation, the image of God renewed by the Spirit echoes that affirmation, and because there are no other options. <laughs> yeah, the impossibility of the contrary. <laughs> the impossibility of the contrary. Yeah, very good. And of course, humanists are not about that one. We, we reject... Uh, we we, we uh, insist on evolution, not because of proof, but because the contrary is completely unacceptable. Well, at least the guy who said that was honest. Mm -hmm. and, and we insist too. Yes, the, the, there is evidence. The problem, the reason you don't see the evidence is not because it's not clear, but because you've put out your own eyes. And having put out your own eyes, obviously you can't see. And so we can hold the sun in front of you and you will say, I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Like the deaf adder that stops its ear. We're back to Phariseeism. <laughs> back to Phariseeism, yeah. Now, the problem here, we're, we're, we're told, well, then you can never communicate with anybody. You've shut yourself out of the discussion. Well, except that God has the power to heal blinded eyes. Even when we did it to ourselves, he has the power to open deaf ears. He has power to transport or trans, what's the word? Transform a stony heart into a heart of flesh. He can do radical open heart surgery at the spiritual level. And he's promised that as we speak his word, particularly as it relates to Jesus and what he's done in coming and dying and rising again, that he will in fact do exactly that. In the meantime, we tell people, this is what we got. This is what it means. This is what it traditionally has produced. This is what we, we can show you it could and should produce. And now we can look at your system from your own point of view and show you that you got nothing. You go nowhere. Your basic presuppositions, your basic assumptions about life, the universe, and everything are all dead ends. And what are you going to do with that? You can repent and say, I am a fool. My rock is not as their rock. I myself being a witness. Or you can... Say, doesn't matter, I'm going to go play video games now, and refuse to face it. You can blow out your mind with drugs or alcohol. 
you can kill yourself because there aren't that many options. Mostly what people do is shout a lot and get very angry at Christians because they they cannot believe that Christianity is true. It's impossible that it could be true. And yet they can't justify their own thinking except to say, well, it's obvious. Or as you say, it's the only thing other than your position that makes any sense. Well, it, no, it doesn't make any sense. Christianity doesn't make sense to you. We understand that it can't make any sense to you because you hate God. And therefore, because you hate God, you cannot accept his existence. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We get that. We understand that. But that doesn't mean you've got anything to build on. And we can look at pagan cultures of various sorts and see what consistent rejection of God does to a culture over a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, or what it does in the life of a very consistent man in the space of a very few years. It's a good place to read the stories of serial killers and such. Yeah. A recent conversation I had uh, with an unbeliever was we were talking about how, how you can know things and why I think the Bible is true. And his argument was basically, well, the Bible's really old <laughs> at the end. <laughs> I'm like, okay. But, you know, it, it's been faithfully preserved by all human standards. You know, compare Julius Caesar. We can go through this sort of line of reasoning that that's not really a good reason to dismiss the Bible throughout mm -hmm. history. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of shows that things were consistent for a long time. And then the person I was talking to sort of said, well, but can we really receive communication across that amount of time and stuff? And I'm like, are we having a conversation right now? <laughs> like it was, it was really strange to me how his, his retreat was into incomprehensibility. Like mm -hmm. there was no basis for our having a conversation. And yet, you know, we kept talking. It was... I don't know. It was funny to me, but I was kind of just laughing on the inside as I try to like, you know, talk him through this, but he doesn't see the irony in that. There's a, uh, a story that Francis Schaeffer tells. I think it's in um, The God Who's There. Maybe he's, he's there and he's not silent. He gave some lectures, I think at Oxford. And one young man desperately had wanted to meet him and to talk with him. And he somehow got to Dr. Schaeffer and invited him out to over to his house for tea. Dr. Schaefer went, uh, and as they began to talk, as Francis Schaefer began to speak true things from the gospel, the young man would say more than once, sir, I do not believe we are communicating. And he kept doing that, sir, I don't believe we're communicating. Sir, I do not believe we're communicating. Finally, Dr. Schaefer noticed that the tea set was all set out with some care and obvious fondness for the whole ceremony and all that. And, Dr. Schaefer says, I said gruffly, give me some tea. And the man was, the young man was kind of startled and almost offended, but he, he reached over and he got the teacup and poured the tea, handed it to Dr. Schaefer. And Dr. Schaefer said, sir, I believe we are communicating. <laughs> the point being that communication does not have to be exhaustive to be true. We know that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And we know that there are secret things that belong to the Lord that he's not revealed to us. But the things that he has revealed, Deuteronomy 29, 29, belong to us and to our children that we may do all the words of this law. God, being a sovereign God, is capable of communicating accurately into our time, into our consciousness, into using our language, which was originally his, he was the first one to use Proto-Hebrew or whatever it was when he said, let there be light. And he's able to communicate accurately. He's also able to preserve the text by any number of methods that are common to humanity, copying, translating, and all of that, because he's sovereign. That's the cool thing. All the, <laughs> well, no, no human being could do this. That's right. We're not talking <laughs> human beings. We're talking a sovereign God. We're not talking any sort of God. No, Odin couldn't do this. Ra couldn't do this. But the Lord God of hosts can. The creator, triune God, can. Because he's all about communication. He loves communication. He is eternal communication. And he made man in his image for the exact purpose of communicating with him. 
telling him true things about himself, about well, about God, about himself, and then about man himself, and then about the world that man lives in. And all these things are true. Now, when God said, let there be light, there's all kinds of things we don't have an answer for. The first one is, and what is this light stuff anyway? Photons, waves, uh, disturbances in space time. We, we still don't know what exactly light is, but we all have a, the experience of light. And we can say, the light in the refrigerator is off again, and we all know exactly what that means. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Even people who haven't had refrigerators probably know what that means. We do not understand when he said, let there be light. How did he do that? We don't know that either. But we know that there were words. We know what the words were, and we know what they intended, and we know what they affected. We know that before there wasn't light, and afterwards there was light, and we have, we've all experienced light. And so there is truth there that we get, and we don't have to know all of it and plumb all of its depths to be able to understand the part that he wants us to understand. And having spoken thus, he then put it into writing, first in Hebrew, and now it's been translated into who knows how many languages, and people all over the world in their own language, 6,000 years later, can read it and say, wow, those were the first words that were ever spoken on earth. They were spoken by God. That's amazing. What a wonderful God. But the kind of things that you're you're talking about are the common staples of philosophy classes and communication classes and all the modern irrational existential things that try to destroy our confidence <laughs> in uh, communication, in self-knowledge. If we can't talk to anybody, can we talk to ourselves? Can we trust our own thoughts? Do we even know what thoughts are? What is this? Who is me? And what is me? What We get a president who says, depends on what the matter, what the word is. <laughs> means. It has practical application throughout life when we no longer know what the words mean, and we deny that we can communicate coherently. Mm -hmm. But the Bible gives us the foundation for all of that. And so, again, as we, as we come to Scripture, it's not that we say, well, this is true because it gives us these wonderful things X, Y, and Z. But this is true because God says it is. And because God is a good God and a wonderful God and a powerful God, oh, look at all these wonderful things that fall out from it. The kind of things that the human heart, being the image of God, naturally feels comfortable with. Communication, love, personality, creativity. These are not things that we work backwards and say, well, you're creative, therefore there's a creator. We say, no, there is a creator, God. Oh, isn't that amazing that you like to do artwork? See, that fits Christianity. It doesn't really fit anything else, but that's okay. You don't have to believe in a creator, God. You can believe your art is a waste of time and a bunch of nonsense. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that in real life, though, like in those words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not. I, and that's that'd, something be I mean. <laughs> that'd be mean. That'd be mean. Yeah, generally, I, 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 I say that, and then I generally do what you just said. Okay, that doesn't mean you say it like that. You say it with some winsomeness and some kindness and a thorough understanding that the person you're talking to is the image of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Dr. Schaefer would be, would be pleased to hear us say these things. <laughs> I think Dr. Van Til would be, too. But too often, Ventilians have gotten the reputation of just drawing the line and saying, you're on the wrong side and walking away. Right, um, which is much I, easier than being a consistent Ventilian or Schaeferian or whatever. Yeah. Because, like, it's so easy to go through life and think, you know, there's this natural antithesis. I'm on this side. You're on that side. Everything you do is in hatred of God. Everything I do is seen through the blood of Christ. But there is deeply embedded, in fact, in... Ventil's writings, the idea of point of contact, yes, which is absolutely. those things like art and music and communication and love and personality that we can point to and say, hey, you understand that. I have an explanation for it. Do you? This is a wonderful thing that we share. Let's talk about it and where it comes from. It's not a closed system and it's not antagonism, although it is antithesis. <laughs> it is antithesis. Uh, Dr. Cornelius Van Til was professor of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia for many, 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 many years. And he, better than anyone else in the modern era, has called us to begin with the Word of God as our given, as our starting point, as our presupposition, and to build on that rather than to begin with ourselves and our own reason and then go try to find God 
which he reminds us again and again, as does scripture itself, that no man seeks after God out of his own fallen nature. It's not that God is irrational or unintelligible. It's that we hate him and we've put out our own eyes and we don't want to see him. Uh, for those of you who have never read Dr. Van Til, uh, you should. I would suggest starting with his little, everything he writes is called a syllabus. He didn't do too many books that he was satisfied with and said, this is a book. But his classroom syllabuses are at many points difficult. He was not always the smoothest of writers. <laughs> his, uh, his little book, that's simply called Apologetics, summarizes his larger book, The Defense of the Faith, and brings a lot of things together in a very small space. So that would probably be a good place to start. And there are others who followed in his wake and have written other books that we'll no doubt recommend someplace along the way. Yeah, they'll be in the show notes. I keep mm -hmm. forgetting to mention our show notes in the episodes, but we have them. <laughs> if we talk about something, there's probably a link to it there. And, and, and I'll where, throw are, out where are these show notes, Emily? The show notes are on our website, um, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. They're probably in your podcast catcher wherever you're listening to this as well. <laughs> is that where they are, David? I'm sorry. Yes. He's nodding his head, yes. Good. We have confirmation from the tech guy. Right. <laughs> um, but I'll add to that a recommendation of his little pamphlet, Van Til's little pamphlet, Why I Believe in God, oh, yes. which is... Just a delight to read, in addition to being very insightful and very thought-provoking. He talks about growing up in Holland and going to his little private school and wearing his little wooden shoes, and it's very cute. It's just written in ordinary conversational language. There's nothing deep and, and philosophical, aside from the fact that it's truth. Right. And, uh, you know, it's an excellent, excellent place to start. And then if you're the scholarly type or you like such oddities as presuppositional apologetics you could pursue further. But what we're saying here is, is nothing that really Calvin and Augustine didn't say or Anselm. In thy light we see light. I believe in order that I may know. God comes first, everything else builds on that. Oh, and while we're on the subject then of apologetics, here is something that's, that's kind of come out of the whole presuppositional movement that's a dog leg to the left. So what you're saying is we should look at everyone's presuppositions, their worldview. So if we line up all the worldviews side by side and we come to them and look at them and check them out, look under the hood, kick the tires, then we'll be able to decide which is the best worldview and that's the one we should choose. <laughs> no, that's Adventures not... Adventures <laughs> in missing the point. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let's look... Presuppositionalism is not just the idea that everyone has presuppositions. Yeah. <laughs> that is true, but that is not the sum total of what we're saying. That's not the sum total at all, but some people seem to think it is. And then they write books. Now, those books may be very valuable in helping us to understand other people's world. You, I'm not knocking that. But the idea that, again, man, as a neutral observer can look at each of these and pick the one that what makes the most sense, fits the universe the best, meets my needs, we're still back on man as this neutral, autonomous observer capable of making what will turn out to be a God-honoring decision in the flesh. We look back at Eve, what, what was she doing but choosing between Yahweh's worldview as actually she understood it and, and the devil mistranslated it, and Satan's worldview. She was, she was looking at presuppositions and, and, and deciding to pick one. The problem is, the moment she decided that God's presuppositions stood on the same level playing field as the devil's, it was over. She already had lost. She'd already sided with the devil by pretending that God wasn't really God at all, but someone who she could bring down to her level and whom she could pass judgment on. She, to borrow Lewis's phrase, she put God in the dock mm -hmm. rather than herself. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not saying anything strange here, and we're not making God unintelligible or irrational or illogical. We're, we're saying those things about us. We're the illogical ones. Mm -hmm. And Our that's sin something distorts we need to remember. Thinking. Yeah. Um, especially, I see this a lot with uh, Roman Catholics who love Aquinas, mm. and sometimes Protestants who are reading existentialism and come to Kierkegaard and are just so relieved <laughs> that he even talks about faith and God. <laughs> that they just think he's he's got it. Finally, somebody who's, you know, answering these objections. No. So reason is a human capacity. And as we are fallen humans, 
our capacity to reason is broken. Yes. It doesn't work. It's <laughs> not that reason is out there and we just have to access it and then we can follow it up the stairs to heaven. No, we, our minds, Van Til, I think, called this the noetic effects of sin. Correct. I don't think that's unique to Van Til, but he used the phrase. That is the effects of sin on the mind, that your ability to reason is not right. It's not working. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a hard thing for people. I mean, the, the, the starting point of the Enlightenment very much was, well, we understand all the religious arguments. They're religious. Let's pick a better playing field. How about mathematics? Look at what Newton was able to do with it. He was able to lasso a comet and predict its, its motions. That kind of logic, that kind of mathematics, we just follow little step-by-step -step things. That's what Descartes was doing. Mm -hmm. We can recreate heaven and earth in our image, and it will be accurate. Just follow me down this logical, mathematical path. Because, you know, again, 2 plus 2 is 4 for everybody, or 1 plus 1 is 2 for everybody. But then you have to step back and say, um, there's so many questions about that. But let's pick the really easy one. What if you're a consistent Hindu? One plus one is it's one. one. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't count. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, um, um, we need to edit a rim shot in there. <laughs> but of course, no humanist is going to say that in so many terms. I'll just try to, to shove it to one side. And yet the truth is that when people from India or that part of the world want to learn engineering, they come to the United States or to England or Germany. They, and when people here want to live, want to a better grasp of, of engineering, computer science, mathematics, or whatever, they don't go and sit at the feet of the Dalai, Dalai, the Dalai Lama. They go to, of all places, Caltech or Cal Poly or MIT, which has a very objective view of mathematics and which would not, for a moment, none of these places, for a moment, would let a Buddhist or Hindu teach mathematics from their religious presuppositions. They would be welcome to those presuppositions as long as they don't bring them into the curriculum. But already we've got some, we've got religious antithesis going on. And this one's not even aimed at us. It's aimed at other religions. <laughs> Reason is not nearly as, as neutral as people would like to believe. Yeah. Ironically, if they go to someplace like Cal State or an American University, they'll probably meet a whole bunch of other Buddhists uh, in the <laughs> other departments that they can talk to. <laughs> this is in true. In the philosophy department. <laughs> or, you know, just in undergrad in general, some guy named Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Who's white, as white as white can be. Sorry, Potentially with dreadlocks, we don't typing. know. Yeah. Uh, we're, he we're... probably likes pour over coffee. Oh, he definitely likes oh. pour-over coffee. I also like pour-over coffee, so I can't really. That's true, but you're not a white guy named Rick with dreadlocks. No. Nor are you a Buddhist. <laughs> All right, before we get off the deep end. Sorry. Actually, no, we're just going to stop there. We're going to do echoes now. Um, it is time for us to tell you what we've been reading and listening to and thinking about in general, um, because... We like to do that. I like to hear it on podcasts. I want to know what people are being shaped by, what art they're enjoying, etc. So, neither of you look like you want to go first. <laughs> oh, Brian will go first. Yay. One came to mind. So, uh, th this actually isn't anything new, uh, unfortunately. But How dare you? I know. <laughs> but I've been listening to them... Uh, this week. So music, uh, this is a music recommendation for everyone, is if you have not yet listened to or heard anything by the Arcadian Wild, you should go mm. listen to the Arcadian Wild. They have, I think they have two full-length albums out right now. They're on Spotify and anywhere else music is, but they they do some really fantastic lyrical work. And one of the things I've noticed about their music that there's probably a philosophical implication you could take from it, but I've, I've just found it interesting. All of their music, I, okay, not all, the majority of their music doesn't end in like a really satisfactory way. Like it's mm. almost on a suspension most of the oh, time. Oh, thanks, Beethoven. And yeah. it's really interesting. But like the, they, they do really good stuff with lyrics. And uh, there's a song they do called Wolves of the Revolution that I really enjoy. 
So I recommend that song and The Man in Room number 39, because The the Man in Room number 39 is really great. And I'll just go on a spiel about this really quick. (laughs) Okay. The lyrics include lines like, Windowless room number 39 holds an honest man with a thirsty mind, but there are no rivers inside these walls. And so he sings, Roaring brooks and gentle streams, uh, these are the things my heart longs to see. And the second stanza has lines like, uh, His glossy shoes only hold him down. They were never meant to cover ground. Mm. So he... Ironically enough, we had just been discussing romanticism. It's a little (laughs) bit romantic in that sense of, you know, he just wants to go out in nature and and avoid looking at books all day, which is a, I I, I sympathize (laughs) a lot. (laughs) But yes, Arcadian Wild, that is my reco. Cool, cool. Greg, your turn. Well, he says reaching back to a stack of books behind him. Uh, I'm going to recommend a really old book. It's called Before Philosophy. I got mine for a buck in a used bookstore. Uh, the copyright date is um, in ancient history sometime. Uh, it looks like maybe f- 1946. Before Philosophy by Henry Frankfurt, Mrs. H.A. A. Frankfurt. I bet they were married. John A. Wilson and Thorkild Jacobson. What a great name. <laughs> It goes back to what we know and can surmise of the philosophers and theologians who existed before Greece, before the pre-Socratics. So we're looking particularly at Mesopotamia and Egypt. And although, as far as I know, none of these authors are Christians, at some point, they, they get it. I unfortunately didn't turn to the great quote, but it amounts to something like, all of the religions of the ancient world assumed a basic continuity between the gods and man, except for the Hebrew faith. Hey, surprise. (laughs) They absolutely insisted that there was a distinction between the creator and the creation. And because of that, and this is as far as I can tell, a secularist who gets it, and then goes on to explain in practical terms how this affected the culture. So we're going back behind the Greeks, which is always nice. I spent um, about a year researching the history of Greek philosophy and education. I hope I never have to do that again. (laughs) Uh, So this this is good for that reason. And it's well-written and it's it's scholarly for sure. Uh, So you have to kind of be interested in in this. Uh, I'm seeing things, subtitles like, Myth and reality, the nature of the universe, the function of the state, the values of life, the cosmos as a state, the function of the state, the good life, and the emancipation of thought from myth, which begins, they say, with the Bible. So that's given some of the things we've talked about and are going to be talking about. I think this this is a crucial to to see someone who's not particularly a Christian say, yeah. The, all the ancient world held the same religious belief and it assumed the continuity of all being. And the Jews were the weird ones out, but it had some practical effects. So there's my recommendation. What's yours, Emily? Cool. Well, since one of you recommended music and the other recommended a book, I'm going to do neither and Ooh. recommend a podcast. I think I spoke to you offline about this. David is so sick of me recommending this because I've been... <laughs> recommending it left and right in real life but now it'll just be recommended and that's the ultimate recommendation and i can move on to talking about other things but the name of the podcast is cooper and carrie have words james carrie is a comedy writer in the uk and he's a member of the church of england and he's reformed and barry cooper is let's see what is he he's like a writer for Ligonier or something, but he's a former actor and comedian. Um, So they talk a lot about art and what it means to make good art as Christians and why don't we? (laughs) That would be a fascinating discussion. Yeah, it's been really great, especially like I grew up on a lot of British sitcoms and... Mm -hmm. Didn't we all? (laughs) (laughs) It's the weirdest thing. It's almost like they have all the good comedy. (laughs) But I always like... When I recommend British comedy to people, usually there's like a caveat, like 
it's British. So there are some bits that are, you know, inappropriate or whatever. Like, it's just kind of a given with British sitcoms sometimes. Not so much the older ones, but the newer ones, definitely. And so to find out James Carey is a sincere Christian and like strong in the faith and is talking about it and all this stuff. It's like, wow, I didn't know we had people over there like doing that. That's cool. So yeah, uh, an exceptional episode was number 69 called He's Got This. It's about the book of Revelation. Um, Uh. We have a guest on, I forget his name, but he wrote a book on Revelation and just did a really good job of walking through the biblical method of reading rather than, you know, putting out his framework first and saying, see, this is how to read it. It's how does the scripture ask to be read? And Mm -hmm. so it's very similar to to your book on Revelation, Greg, in that respect. Oh, thank you for the plug. Yes. That'll be my other recommendation. Bonus, Greg's (laughs) book on Revelation, A Whole New World. Yeah, there's actually been, uh, I'll I'll piggyback on on that since they talk about Christian art not being well, we'll just move past that. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's been a. I'll, I'll, I'll look them up and uh, see if I can send them to you before this episode goes live, so they can be in the show notes, and it can just be. Here's the thing, Brian couldn't remember on the show. <laughs> there's been uh, several really interesting video essays on YouTube that I've watched from believers talking about Christian movies in particular, but also other Christian media. And why they are specifically so bad. <laughs> there's yeah. no there's no way to hide it. Yeah. Specifically one one point that springs to memory is uh that for the most part, Christian movies are created, written, acted, and billed as evangelism. Yeah. They're, so, they're a message thinly veiled. It's propaganda. A, it's it's essentially very poorly written propaganda. And the yeah. whole idea is you should go see this movie. And there's there's two reasons typically given. You should go see this movie to support other Christians who are in the arts. Uh-huh. No, Not because it's a good movie. Good art yeah. so that Christians will become good artists. So. And the second one is you should also show this to your atheist, agnostic, whatever friends. Because, because then they the will see the beauty of Christianity. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't... If you've ever heard any secular individual's opinions on a movie like God's Not Dead, uh, you know that doesn't work. Yes. Yeah, not indeed. so much. So anyway, that um, is my on the other hand, piggyback. Non-Christian Christian movies like Chariots of Fire and Henry V mm. were incredible movies. Yeah. Uh, testimonies to the gospel because they weren't testimonies to the gospel. They were actual <laughs> films about real human things. Just a couple of the characters like O King Harold uh, Harry happened to be well Christians, mm. and you got a Christian writer named Shakespeare that kind of helped. Just kind of <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, my daughter Emily is going through a, a class uh, at UC Davis where. They are asking the question, was Shakespeare a Roman Catholic? <laughs> it's, it's after hearing her, it's not as far out as it sounds, but it's still pretty far out. But Just I'm giving her bit. the benefit of the doubt as she listens to it. <laughs> but along with this, the rest of this, as you know, while well, Emily's a writer, I'm a sometime writer. I'm also a, a direct theater. And one of the, and I'm a literature teacher, one of the complaints that I've gotten from someone who ought to know better particularly is, why don't you do Christian plays? Mm. And the answer is... Which one? What What Christian Christian plays? plays? Oh, you know what? Yeah, we've talked about this before. And you're like, they're all Anglican. And (laughs) I was like, wait, no, there's the screw tape letters. That was a great play. And then I was like, C.S. Lewis was was Anglican. Anglican. Never mind. Shutting up. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So there's that, and I, so I hope that your uh, your friends on the podcast are talking not only about the theological roots, I mean, Presbyterianism, Reformed theology, we freely confess that God's the creator, so what did we miss? I have some ideas, and I don't want to get myself in trouble, <laughs> but um, there's there's more than abstract theology. There's how you use the Bible, there's how you worship, things that 
a given theology may allow more flex room than you think. Uh, I mean, the Puritans didn't want to use instruments in music. Most Presbyterians and Reformed people are fine with that. So it's the same theology, more or less. But there may be liturgical options that are not apostate <laughs> and that might show us something. But I'm going to retreat from that before someone labels me Anglican, because I'm not. <laughs> And we're also running out of time, you, so okay. <laughs> we, we don't have time for you to uh, get yourself in, in more trouble. too much in trouble. Too much trouble. I mean, you've, you've already made certain people angry. They think you're a papist sympathizer already. Uh, Instruments yeah. in worship? How dare you? Uh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, who has gone to great lengths to make this podcast listenable. We appreciate him. You can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can check out our Facebook page, which I haven't mentioned yet, but it's alive and kicking. Just called Halting Towards Zion. You can check out our show notes and transcripts. If you are more of a podcast reader than listener, you can do that. And find me on Goodreads. That's like the social media I'm on these days. It's goodreads.com. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.